Hats up, Pooh. I am Rakeith Kajara Nia Nebihet. I am the High Priestess and founder of the Raseki Arts Temple. And I am a natural healer, an educator, activist, author, and mother. And I am also from Virginia. My people are from Virginia on my mother's and my father's side. And Virginia is a land that has been known to be um, rich with a strong history because it is one of the port cities or one of the port cities where our people were brought into this country actually is in Virginia. So there is a river, the James River, that comes from um, Williamsburg area. So the ocean opens up in the Williamsburg area and the ships were actually brought up into the Richmond area, what is now known as Richmond, um, through that James River. And we spent actually a few years there um, going, the ancestors called us to go there to make offerings to appease the spirits of the ancestors that were brought there. And during that time that we did this, it was probably the early, it was around 2000 or maybe 1999 that we would go to the port and we were told to dress in white and take offerings and just, you know, send out prayers to the ancestor spirits that were brought in in that area. And so we did that for about two years and after doing it for a few years, the actual site became known as a historical site. And that was really powerful because so many ancestors had been brought through there. And while we were doing the offerings there during that time, um, I had many experiences and visions of the ancestors being marched through and many of them um, not making it off the ship sometimes um, many of them just wailing out and just so confused. I could feel their energy um, when we would go there and we would cry and cry and cry, crying their tears, crying along with them, and um, just really making that connection with the ancestors there who were some of my ancestors, of course. ancestral connection is very powerful when we are able to tap into it and to know that when we see things or hear certain things it's not just a, always a random thought you know we are hearing and seeing things for a reason and so it was really during that time that I began to be more clear about my my gift in being a medium and being able to communicate with the ancestors and knowing that they have always communicated with me even from the time that I was very young and they have guided me you know and when I listen to them then I have very good results so um, when it comes to the healing I actually um, I got very sick when I was about 16 years old and I was in a lot of pain. And by that time in my life, I had already come in contact with a Baptist church, with the Jehovah Witnesses, with some Muslim people. So I was aware that spirit moved and worked 
in many ways and even had different names. And um, so when I got very sick, then um, I remember just, I don't know if I went to the doctor. I think I went to a doctor and they told me they couldn't help me. And um, so I, I went home and I just remember crying because I was in so much pain. And then I heard a voice that said, well, just put your hands where you're hurting and pray. And I did. And I remember just, you know, doing that over and over, just please, please help me, you know, help me to feel better. I don't want to be sick like this, you know, and I fell asleep. And then the next day when I got up, my pain was gone and it was gone. Like it never came back. So um, I just remember thinking to myself like, wow, <laughs> I really did that. Like I really was able to clear my pain, even though the doctor said that he couldn't. So that um, gave me a certain confidence, I would say, in my guides, in the voices that were speaking to me. I remember just feeling very comfortable with listening to them from that point on. And I had been um, listening to them even before that time because I was raised the only child until I was about 13. And I spent a lot of time alone but yet I knew I was never really alone. <laughs> I knew that I had energies around me and they, they would speak to me, you know, and I just didn't know what it was. And I didn't even mention it to anyone, but it was just a knowing that I had. Even from the time I was young, I was always also on a quest for learning the truth. I was always a spiritual person and I knew that prayer worked and I knew that, you know, I had power. And I also knew that I didn't really know <laughs> a lot because of the Christianity and the things that I had been taught. It just did not make sense to me. And so I went on a quest to find the truth, to find, you know, what people were doing before Christianity, before Hebrew, before Islam, you know, there were, had to been some things going on before then. And that really led me on to West African spiritual systems and um, ancient Egypt, or what we call Kemet. And I began to realize too that I had that connection with that um, information with, with those systems because like for instance, when I was in high school, I used to doodle, everybody doodles in high school. But one thing that I would doodle would be an eye. I would just always draw this eye. And so I later on realized I was drawing like the Eye of Ra or the Eye of Heru. And Sekhmet is also called the Eye of Ra or the Eye of Heru. So I found through my life that there's been many, many, many times that um, the connection that I have with like my soul connection with my past lifetimes is still a part of who I am. So the work that I'm doing, I realize is work that is, is something that I've been doing probably for thousands and thousands of years because it is very natural to me. I did not even hear about Reiki until 15 years later. I remember reading 
a pamphlet, a little brochure um, that someone wrote about Reiki. And it was just describing um, the power of using your hands to heal. And I just remember the power of using your hands to heal. And I said, well, that's, that's what I did. I, <laughs> what is this Reiki? So I realized, um, you know, that I had that connection to it and reached out to the people who gave me the brochure who were actually students of the comedic sciences. These were people who were out of New York. They had a temple there, a healing temple, and they did massages and Reiki and so on. And so I made the connection and got a teacher to come from New York to Virginia, where we were. And um, when he met me and attuned me uh, or taught the class, he said that his spirit guides told him to give me all three Reiki attunements in that one weekend. So we were really only going to do, I think the first and second level maybe, but I ended up receiving the attunements and the information for all three levels because he said that I had the gift and that's what they told him. So um, with that, I began my practice fasting for 21 days like on and off through that time period um, doing a lot of cleansing and purifying of my own body and my mind and I would say after that time um, I began to really practice the healing work so I had already been making herbal remedies I had already been studying herbs studying crystals and I had been making herbal remedies I had been teaching um, people how to cook more healthy foods because I became a vegan vegetarian um, mm. <laughs> probably the early 90s um, and so I was already on that path of learning to work with the elements learning to work with the forces <laughs> Um, also in my 20s, I began to realize that ancestors were speaking to me and not just my own, but other people's ancestors. And I would find myself in different places and um, just hear all these voices. And sometimes it was overwhelming. Um, at, I think at one point I even thought I was going crazy because I didn't know, you know, why I was hearing all of these voices. And then it began to shift, like I didn't always hear the voices the same way and they began to be more directive when I heard the voices. And I went through a few different exercises of them telling me to um, go tell this person, this particular, I could be like in a store or anywhere out and about and just hear this message, go over there and tell such and such, this, 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 this. And I'm looking like, I don't even know that person. I'm not <laughs> going to do that. And they would say, oh, yeah, you're going to do it. Yes, go give them a message. Go give them a message. Go give them a message until I did it. And then when I did deliver the message, the person would always say, 
oh, thank you, you know, I could really see that it was something that they needed to hear, but they just weren't hearing it, and I was able to hear it. So when I understood that, then I began to be at peace with it, <laughs> and um, I would be more um, confident about delivering the message messages that I was hearing and in understanding that, you know, I was really connected, you know, to not just my own spirit guides and ancestors, but to the realm of the ancestors. Raseki. So after those initiations that I went through, uh, I began to practice Reiki on others. I was having meetings with women and just being more active overall in my healing work. And at that time, black people did not know anything about Reiki. <laughs> it's like it was so out of the blue or just so out of the ordinary. Um, and then when I would mention laying on of hands, then people would say, oh, okay, so if you say Reiki, they were like, I don't know what you're talking about. But Reiki is a process that deals with laying on of hands, and that is something that has been done in churches and just outside of churches whenever people are sick. <laughs> it is something that people do, lay their hands on others and um, bring healing. And I actually did witness that happening at a church when I was a young person. I remember seeing a pastor who had come in from out of town to my grandmama's church and they had the little tent thing up and everything and he was doing healing work on people and everybody who needed healing, he was calling them down to um, say some prayers over them to heal them. And he was actually healing people. Like these people were actually um, feeling better. You can see after he said a prayer over them, the change that came over them. And I remember that making an impression on me as well. So um, later on, when I began teaching or practicing, because I didn't start teaching until seven years after I got my attunement. Um, and that is because I wanted to practice. That was a, a process. Um, and as I began to work with people and begin to understand how the energy feels and how it moves and how it flows and how Reiki is about, it's about laying on of hands, but I found it to be about much more because it's a, a practice of healing the mind, body, and spirit. And so in doing that, we can use all things natural to heal. So we begin, I began to understand the whole process of um, disease and how people get out of balance. And then I could also see how to bring them back into balance um, using hands, using the power of prayer, using um, the ability to focus and concentrate, using sound therapy, color therapy, crystal therapy, all of these things, um, which I had been learning about before, even aromatherapy and herbal therapy, all of these things are a part of energy healing because you're putting your energy on it. You're using natural things which has energy to heal. And this is something that our ancient ancestors did long before um, Western medicine came along. We were able to look at someone all over and some cases we would do readings to see and confirm what we were feeling, but we would be able to find out, you know, what is out of balance or what is their sickness, and then also figure out how to heal it using the elements that we have around us. Because in ancient Africa, we didn't have um, Walgreens we could run to and just buy pills. We had to go out and actually find the herbs that were needed or the sounds or the colors or the fragrances, whatever it took to bring that balance into that person. So that is something that began to um, just be more clear to me. And I also realized that I had a connection to the goddess Sekhmet, 
who is known to be the great mother healer and the destroyer of evil. She also represents our Sekhem or our life force energy. And Sekhmet um, began to talk to me. <laughs> Sekhmet began to talk to me. <laughs> I'm laughing because I remember telling people that. And, you know, when you tell people that the gods or goddesses are talking to you, you know, they have a lot of doubt. And so <laughs> there was a lot of doubt, you know, with what I was doing when I began and still to this day. But for me, it was very real. And Segment began to show me that I am and I always have been uh, her daughter. I've been connected to her. I'm here to represent her on the planet at this time and to help bring forth healing. And she told me directly that um, our people needed to learn about energy healing. And that was something that would help to resurrect us and help to heal us and to restore us back to our greatness. And she said that I was to teach energy healing to our people and to go to cities with a high population of melanated people so that um, that energy can begin to flow once again because we used to be aware of our energy we used to be aware of our power and you know for many hundreds of years now we have been kind of ignorant or in the dark about that but once we understand energy once again then we will be able to move things without touching it we will be able to speak without using the cell phones because that is how energy flows and that is just how powerful we can be. We were before, we can be that powerful once again. So when we understand energy and how to manipulate it, how to transform it, how to master it, then really it's nothing that we can't do. So that is a part of our practice, um, just really teaching our people how to work with energy but also how to use it to heal because we have been through many thousands of years of trauma, colonialism, enslavement, and just oppression, you know, and it has caused some negative shifts in our energetic field. This is why we're so weak, why our families are weak, why, you know, we are just easily influenced <laughs> because our power, our sekhem, is weak right now. Um, they've been poisoning the food, the water, the air for some time now, so it's not by coincidence. But when our energy is strong, we can still overcome all of those poisons and toxins and be able to overcome disease or whatever else the challenge that we Man, Keperu, and Minta, hey, you. Nuku, eh, aminu, in pu, amiku, amen, re, tu, I am. I got the message to teach and tell our people. I was also told to tell our people about segment because segment is outside of us but also inside of us and so when we call on segment we are calling on that energy that fights for the right we're calling on our immune systems to be stronger and our um spiritual power to be stronger overall so the name Raseki came to me um around that same time i was getting a lot of messages and downloads and um i heard very clearly that the practice that i was to teach is to be called Raseki and the Ra because of course we're dealing with that infinite energy that comes from the sun not the sun itself but the energy that comes from the sun which feeds everything on this planet as well as several others so that infinite energy source when we connect with it consciously then we're able to do anything basically the Seki refers to our own personal Sekim, our own personal life force. So when we do our healing work, when we're working with energy, we want to consciously connect ourselves and our life force to that of the infinite source. And in that way, we are able to channel that infinite energy through us to do whatever it is that we are intending to do. 
the key itself also refers to the the life force energy the the sekim is the power the key is the life force energy it's also called chi or prana and in the ancient times in the fan language they also use that word key um, to refer to that life force energy so we know that that is an ancient ancient tongue an ancient um, sacred word and frequency when we're talking about the life force energy and it is and it is something that we all should be aware of and be using and cultivating on a regular basis because that is really what keeps us alive when the life force is low we become weak and close to death and you know we don't want that <laughs> so uh, we do need to understand energy and how we can use it and really that is what our practice is about you know healing using our energy using our minds using our knowledge using everything that we can because when we're sick we're not just sick physically like when you become sick and you have a physical or physical symptoms that is really the last stage of disease once the body starts breaking down and feeling pain that is the body saying hey I need some attention. I need you to do something about me. And if we just address the physical pain, then we don't get a full and complete healing. So in some medicine systems, they just address the symptoms and not deal with the cause of the sickness or the disease. And we understand that most disease really has its foundation in uh, emotional trauma, or emotional feelings that haven't been resolved or spiritual um, disconnect which causes a void within someone um, and also the things that people eat and things that they're consuming things they're seeing and hearing can also cause different forms of disease as well so you have to deal with those aspects those um, foundational issues in order to bring about healing and this is why a woman can have fibroid tumors go to the doctor get the tumors cut out and then they grow back again because she hasn't changed she hasn't changed her eating habits most likely and she hasn't changed or resolved whatever caused the tumors in the first place so when you deal with energy healing you want to get to the root cause of it so we do also do a little counseling as well uh, in, our, in our healing work because a lot of times people just need to get their feelings out and express them and to gain a different perspective in how they're seeing those things. So we heal um, on a holistic level using the energy and everything you know that we can to help bring about healing for people. And this is the way that our ancient ancestors did it and they have revealed to me in so many ways you know there's walls on the pyramid walls, there's um, pictures, excuse me, on the pyramid walls, there are also scripts, you know, other things, and then the stories that have been passed down, and then the fact that we're able to channel and really um, bring forth those traditions. A lot of times they don't all die, you know, because our DNA and our memory comes from our ancestors. So that is why you can go to your grandmother's house or one of your great aunts and they will have an altar set up. They'll have a little corner with all their little special stuff and they don't want you to touch it. And that is their little altar because innately they want to have this sacred space and they do it. <laughs> all of us, you know, some of us have the ancestors um, on their walls they would have pictures of all the ancestors in the family you know in a certain area all together creating an ancestor altar not realizing or doing it consciously but because that is a part of our tradition and when we are open to hearing those messages then we're able to you know do the things that do have to keep us balanced and those little sacred places in the house do keep balance <laughs> in the homes that they are in and if you move something you're gonna throw the flow off and they'll know instantly who touched my thing so you know it's, it's serving its purpose and it is a part of that tradition and that culture 
that is a part of us. So I have studied, I am a freedom fighter. The healing work that I'm doing is for freedom. You know, we want to be free in mind, body, and spirit. And so I've also learned about some other freedom fighters and things that they did in their practices to get their freedom. And we had the stories of Harriet Tubman, one of my divine spirit guides who has shown me um, so many things and how she was able to put an invisibility shield around herself and the people that she was rolling with and just um, able to tune in to the elements in a way that they knew when to move, when to not move. They were able to listen to the animals to know if there was other people in the bush out there, um, even to move with the water, you know, without being drowned. Uh, because they did have to cross that Ohio River to get to freedom and other waterways as well, going through the swamps and things like that. And what I'm, when you go through a swamp, it's all kinds of critters, <laughs> you know, alligators and snakes and whatnot. So, you know, they had to know how to work with those elements in order to, to be able to move through. And, you know, we know this because the ancestors still speak to us. They still give us signs. Um, um, we just have to pay attention that they speak to us all the time. We just have to really learn how to tune in and remember that we are not alone and that they are working with us. They, they want us to be successful, to be happy, to be content. We are really not meant to struggle any longer. Like, you know, the time of other people's rule is over. It's just a matter of time before we realize that and we become more empowered and then take our power. And taking it just in, you know, taking our place in society and building our communities and building our families, all of those things are a part of taking our power because they can easily destroy people who are divided. They can ease, and that is exactly what has happened. So once we are more aware of those types of things, the tricks that have been played, then we can overcome them and rectify them. And that's what the healing, you know, this time I've been told over and over and over, this is a time for our people to heal because we've been through a lot of trauma, but we have not healed from the trauma. We've learned our history, we've learned how to eat properly, we've learned all of these things, but until we really take the time to heal our minds, to heal our culture, to heal our spirits and our bodies, we won't be able to overcome anything. We can't even work together. I had an elder tell me, that the reason why most organizations in our community fail and don't really get too far is because they are led by leaders who are sick and need healing. And I can honestly say, looking back through the history of our organizations, many of those men who were leading, they did some sick things, you know. And I mean, the healing has to occur for our people men, women, children, all of us. We have been abused and tortured in so many ways. And until we rectify and resolve and heal those things, we won't be able to be the powerful great beings that we really are. So that really is the focus of our temple and the work that we're doing. We consider ourselves to be leaders in the healing of our people in this country and prayerfully all over the world. I'm Voodoo Queen Kalina Laveau, and I am the Voodoo Queen of New Orleans, and I practice the Louisiana tradition of Voodoo. So Voodoo actually came here with our ancestors 
in the 1700s. And most of the time, people get that information confused. They believe that it came later with the Haitian Revolution, but that actually happened about 100 years after voodoo had developed in Louisiana. So the voodoo that we had here actually came more from the Mamiwata tradition. And this is the tradition uh, we refer to as Momodilo, which means Mami Water, Mother of the Waters. So you'll see voodoo queens dancing with snakes, and this snake is central to the practice because the snake is the oracle. So when the voodoo queen dances with the snake, she is becoming the oracle and she's giving messages. So this is the primary symbol of divination in this tradition. The movements are very fluid. The dance is very fluid. So when she's dancing, she is becoming the water. She is becoming the mermaid. She is becoming uh, that serpent energy. And that's the way that she can deliver the messages. So this is one form of divination. Just the serpent dance or the snake dance itself is one of the main forms of divination that happens within the ceremony. No matter which form of divination that I'm doing, I will always have the snake and I'll always have the water. So either I'll come with my actual snake or I'll use the snake skin from my snake. And that will be present when I'm doing divination. I'll also have water. One of my easiest forms of divination is to look through the water. So I may sit and look through a clear bowl or a clear glass of water to do my divination, or I might submerge myself in water. Now, of course, I don't do this necessarily uh, right there with my clients, but before I do a ceremony, before I do divination for people, or when I'm getting messages from my own ancestors, I will submerge myself in water, and I do this pretty much every day. Uh, I'll spend at least three hours of my day in water, and when I come out, I come out with lots of answers. I come out with lots of clarity, but my people are water people. My mother and my grandmother transferred this tradition to me. We spend lots of time in water. A lot of the ceremonies that were performed on me as a child had to do with water. The cleansing rituals, you know, the way that we uh, divined uh, the dreams, everything was surrounding water. So this was directly passed to me uh, from my mother, from my grandmother, and then her mother, and so on. So I actually use a lot of different uh, methods to divine. Uh, the first was, of course, the water. Uh, also laying hands. So I lay hands as a, as a way of healing. But as you're healing the person, there's a lot of information that you can find out as well. Now, I also used to be a natural hair stylist. And I would refer to myself as a natural hair healer because even though I did really good hair styling, my concern was the health and the healing of that woman or that person and the hair. So most of the time people would come to me with their hair very fragile, broken, uh, some may have even been losing hair, and we would work to restore that hair, you know, restore you know, the hair back to health. So in the process of doing that, you also learn a lot about the person because you're constantly in contact with that person's head. The head is the most important part, you know, 
this is where the spirit is. This is where we focus a lot of our energy and ritual. So by dealing with just that hair, I might have a 60 something year old woman crying her eyes out like a small child because she's dealing with some of those repressed memories that are coming out, just me touching her head, you know. Maybe she's been told some really negative things growing up. Or maybe it's some memories that she just didn't allow herself to recall, but it came out just by having somebody, uh, you know, rub the head or, you know, manipulate the hair. So I was able to transfer lots of healing, but also receive lots of messages just with the hair. Then later, you know, um, I got more clients where I did the laying of hands, the same result. You know, you transfer healing, but you're also um, able to sense and, and feel what's happened. So for instance, if a woman has gotten an abortion or she's been violated, I can feel that. If someone has had an injury, I can feel that. If someone was born with some type of uh, abnormality, you know, such as oh, a weak ankle or, you know, one leg smaller than the other, even if they have this themselves covered uh, through pants or through a skirt, just by hovering my hand over the body, I can feel that energy. Um, in addition to the laying of hands, uh, I also learned to read bones. Uh, that was something that was actually taught to me. Um, I learned to read playing cards first. Later on, I learned to read tarot cards. Um, further down the line, I learned how to read shells. And in my family, dreams have always been very important. Um, and that, I'm, I'm, that was one of the things that I didn't have to have much uh, study as far as interpreting dreams. But that's one of the main ways that I divine for myself. I get messages through the water and I also get my messages through dreams. Actually, my grandmother, my mother as well, but my grandmother used to get a lot of, she got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, medicines through dreams. So one time in particular when I was a baby, um, I was sick and there was nothing, you know, the doctors really couldn't diagnose what was going on with me and uh, nobody could really figure it out. There was no remedy, but I, being such a small baby, you know, there's not much time. I was also a premature baby and also a twin. Um, not, not having much time, you know, with, with a small baby, you can't spend too many days trying to figure out what's wrong. Something needs to happen immediately because the baby is small, the baby is fragile. So, you know, I had been to the pediatrician, you know, everybody tried to figure out what could be done. And so my grandmother, uh, they said she got really, really sleepy. You know, she was up with everyone else, of course, worrying. She got really sleepy. And when she laid down to go, to go to sleep, she woke up with a dream that she had and it told her exactly what to mix up to give to me and I was fine.
this is uh, some of the examples of you know what what that dream divination is um, basically when I'm reading any anything whether it be through the water whether it be using the bones whether it be using the shells whether it be using any type of cards laying hands it's really the same method for me because it's not so much about studying uh, the kind of pre-written meanings to certain patterns or uh, certain meanings of, of, of cards or anything like that. It's really a way to see the same dream symbology that I would see through the water or that I would see, you know, in a dream. So when I lay out cards even, it's not even about the interpretation of what you might find in a book about the, the cards mean this. I'm looking for that dream symbology, the same images that uh, my ancestors would, and my spirits would speak to me uh, at any other time. Something that's good to know about voodoo in Louisiana, and voodoo in Louisiana is not just in New Orleans, it's all over Louisiana. So there are more rural parts of Louisiana where the tradition was pre preserved a little better because New Orleans is a port city. And so in a port city, you know, you have lots of influences coming in and out. Um, in the rural parts, you really don't have those influences. So you have the tradition preserved through families a little bit tighter. Um, much of voodoo up until now, voodoo in Louisiana has been uh, done in secret and it wasn't something that people were willing to talk about. Um, first of all, there was a time in history when you could be killed for practicing voodoo or you could be um, heavily penalized, jailed practicing voodoo uh, and then later on it became the whole social stigma so once we were brainwashed into believing that our healing traditions were for something negative or that it was devil worship or that it was evil then you have the social stigma of practicing voodoo so then your very own people would look at you as if you know you would do them harm or if you're doing something that is evil or you know of the devil so up until now there was not a lot of talk from the the people who carry the voodoo in their bloodline there were lots of outside writers but those are people who did not possibly and could not possibly know what was really happening on the inside because they were not a part of it so most of what has been said about this tradition has been misinformation sometimes it was intentionally manipulated to make it look as if it was something crazy or something that was just for show. And then later on, there was a lot of misinformation about the voodoo in New Orleans just being more of a watered down version of Haitian voodoo. Let me be clear, Haitian voodoo, New Orleans voodoo or Louisiana voodoo, the same as the entire culture. Haitian Creole culture and language and Louisiana Creole culture and language have similarities. They are sisters, but they are not the same. One is not the mother of the other. Africa is the mother of both traditions. And so the tradition in Louisiana, whether we're talking about the entire Creole culture, the voodoo, the language, or whether we're talking about the one in Haiti, they develop simultaneously. So the voodoo in Louisiana had to do with the specific nations that were there. So they talk a lot about uh, the Congo being here. So the Congo, of course, that was a very heavy influence on the voodoo in Louisiana, but also the Ebe. And that's something that you don't hear as often. Lots of times when you hear about the ancestry here in Louisiana, they will speak about Senegal, they'll speak about Gambia, they'll speak about 
you know, the Wolof, the Bambara, um, they'll talk about the Congo, sometimes they'll even mention the Fon, but they, they don't really say Ebe too much in a lot of the uh, most uh, recent uh, information, especially tourist information. So that played a part in what type of voodoo was here, what, who are the ancestors uh, that were here. You know, who carried this tradition? Who were the people? And that was a similar, but still different story in Haiti. Haiti had heavy Fon influence. They also had, you know, other influences. They had Congo as well. They had Igbo. You know, they had their own influence as well, but the story was different. The type of oppression that we faced here was not exactly the same that we faced in Haiti. And so understand that a lot of what voodoo is about is the rebellion. It, the primary thing that we needed to do was to free ourselves from enslavement. So there's a lot of misinformation out about voodoo being for negativity, being for harm, being for revenge. No, voodoo was about rebellion. And so when you're in a position where you are being enslaved by people who have numbers, they have guns, they have weapons, they have laws, they have figured out every way to destroy you, then that voodoo has to take on another turn. So we have a lot of fire rites in voodoo. We have the flambo and we have the petuo. And the reason why we have that is because this is about freedom. So everything can't be just about the niceness it can't just be about what is so beautiful. And when you get to the bottom of it, it still is about what is beautiful. Freedom is beautiful. But the focus here was to protect ourselves, to free ourselves, to heal ourselves. These are the concerns of a people who are in bondage. It's not about getting back at your fellow neighbor, another black person. It's not about that type of revenge. It's not about making someone fall in love with you. It's not about that. We had to concern ourselves with what was important and our safety, our freedom. That's what was important. So the reason why it was important to demonize the tradition of voodoo was because if you are trying to enslave a people as a white slave owner, if you're trying to enslave a people, you don't want a tradition that, number one, speaks of your identity and your history. So this is a very empowering tradition. You don't have to guess who you are. We can go to divination and we can find out who you are and where you came from, and we still can today. I do that every day. So not only does this tradition tell you who you are, where you came from, the achievements of your people, the possibilities of your people, but it also has a power to it that they, slave owners, did not understand. So how can you harm people who have a relationship with water and fire and air how can you harm a people or be any competition to people who can bring on a storm? That's not a, a it, that's impossible. So they had to take away our true essence, the true self. They had to destroy that and they had to give us a false sense of self, a false sense of who we were. And so that is how we became Christians. And so to put us in that position of being Christian was basically a part of the enslavement. You need to bow down to someone who looks like your slave master. You need to bow down to somebody who is your oppressor rather than understanding your divinity as a reflection of yourself rather than understanding your divinity as the very hands who took care of you, your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfathers, and so on. So now we're faced with 
the fact that everybody else has tried to tell this story. They've tried to tell the story of voodoo and they have fabricated a lot. Lots of people are getting rich off of this. Uh, and those are people who don't carry the voodoo in their bloodlines. This is a bloodline tradition. You cannot have the spirits given to you. You are born with this in your bloodline. Ceremonies may be performed in certain parts of life to awaken certain things, to give you a certain understanding, to give you a certain uh, protection, but nobody can give you your spirits. That is false. You have the spirits, you were born with the spirits, and then at certain points, you learn how to interact with the spirits. You learn how you relate to the rest of the world. And the thing about it is that in the beginning, we were doing that in our family, so there was no such thing as traveling overseas and paying somebody a ridiculous amount of money to give you the spirits. Your mama gave you the spirits. Your grandfather gave you the spirits. And there was no question there of trust because you trust your mama. You trust your family members. So there's no worry there and they were going to give you the best that they had and they did give us the best that they had and so much so that even when they could not tell us this is what we're practicing i'm giving you voodoo i'm giving you hoodoo they found a way to give it to us hidden in plain sight so we never stopped the practices we never stopped making quilts we never stopped making herbal remedies we never stopped with bath rituals we never stopped with the bead work that we do here in New Orleans. We never stopped with the interpreting of dreams. We never stopped putting medicine in food. We still do all of those things, even today. The problem is, is that we don't always give our tradition credit. So because we feel empty, because we have a low self-esteem, based on the fact that we think we didn't come from anywhere, or that we don't have anything, or that what we had is lost to us, then we feel the need to go out and get something from some other people who do not necessarily care about us, who don't necessarily have our best interests in mind, who will manipulate the situation so that money continues to pour from your pocket to their pocket. What we have to do is we have to return back to what our ancestors did. And keep in mind, our story, at one point we all had a story that began in Africa. And when we came here, our story went one direction. Africans, their story went another direction. And even when we got here, so what happened to my people in Louisiana is not quite the same as what happened in Brazil. It's not quite the same as what happened in Haiti or Cuba. So even though we have a lot of shared experiences and there's lots that we can all teach each other based on our individual traditions, we cannot replace our traditions with somebody else's traditions. It's like saying, my history is not good enough, so I think I'm gonna adopt somebody else's history. So even though we may have had some of the oldest ancestors in common, you have to look at your most recent ones. And we cannot throw away our mothers, our grandmothers, our great, 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 great grandmothers, because we prefer the look and the appeal of what it looks like in Brazil, or what it looks like in Africa, or what it looks like in Haiti. You can't do that, because then you're not really connecting to anything that has anything to do with you. And so then it's just a lie. It's just something else to put on to make you feel good. So the only real work that ever gets done is to really deal with your ancestors and your tradition that's here. And the voodoo that is here is still in place. There are still people who hold this tradition, still people who understand this tradition. There are resources now. There's always been resources, but now they're more easily available. 
And then you have the number one source is that you need to be connecting with your own ancestors. And you can do that by way of ritual. If you ask them, they will come. If you ask a question, they will answer it. It's just a matter of knowing how they answer questions. And that's something that can be learned. That's information that's available. So I think that's all I have to say. of my ancestry and reconnecting with them and understanding. Um, when I was a child, my mother passed. Um, before, before she passed, she had raised me in the kind of Southern Baptist tradition, very, very, very into uh, Jesus and the, you know, the church and the Baptist church and catching the Holy Spirit every Sunday. And she was really, really involved with that. And she passed um, she died of breast cancer at a young age, and I was quite young also. And after she died, because she had been sick for such a long time in the hospital, I didn't really get to see her. So she came back to me when I was eight years old. She came to me the day that she was buried, and she told me that she was sorry that she hadn't been able to say goodbye and that we hadn't been able to see each other. And that connect with her, that moment of connection was my introduction to the fact that our, when we, first of all, that when we die, we're not just dead, we're not just husks that just disappear and turn into nothing. We're actually in, inhabited by the spirit, by our spirit, who comes here and chooses to incarnate, and my mother had left her body, yet she was still there. The essence of who she was was still there with me. And so that was the, the biggest gift that she could have possibly given me. Something that I had carried always through my life. So uh, that was kind of like I said, the introduction to to my ancestor worship because I knew she was there. So I used to use any opportunities that I was able to to connect with her. Um, so I taught myself these different techniques. Like I would look at books in the library and learn different techniques about magic, about uh, witchcraft, and different things that were supposed to be able to call these spirits to you and bring them back so that I could speak to her because I wanted to keep her with me. I knew that. No matter what, the fact that she was gone, she wasn't really gone. She had reached out to come back to me so that I knew I could reach out to her. And she told me that, I, that she would always be with me. And at the time, there, were no, there was no way of knowing how I could do that. So I had a lot of trial and error over the years about connecting with her and about finding different means. And at the time, because of, I guess, growing up in North America, um, the only means that I knew of were, were different nature worship rituals where I would collect sticks and rocks and uh, flowers and things like that, leaves from outside, and I would make a little, I had a little table where I would put them all, and I would just sit and put a candle in the middle of those, and I would just meditate with the candle and feel the connection to nature. And whenever I felt the strongest in my connection with nature is when I would be able to hear my mother's voice come to me. So I started to ritualize that practice.
over the years, there's this lifelong, there's been this lifelong process of reconnecting, of coming back home. And I had remembered since I was a little girl, probably at about 13, is the first time I remembered that my spirit was from Kemet. And so I always had an interest. I would always collect books and figurines. And um, I remember for one Halloween, I tried to be all set for, <laughs> for Halloween and I couldn't quite make the all the, the feathered wings that were, <laughs> were necessary the way they were envisioned in my mind. But, um, so um, fast forwarding really far um, to forward into my connection with Wajet and the yoga system that I created, um, going up and down the Gullah Corridor during the time of my transition through these different states and trying to find where my home was because I didn't feel happy in any place that I was. I had lived in London for 10 years and I came back to the States and I just didn't feel happy in New Jersey. So I left and I came to Florida, but I felt like there was something missing in my ability to stay in the space here. There was something calling me forward still. So I left here and I felt a really strong connection to connect to my maternal roots. And by then I knew that my, my blood circle was with my mother, and was through my mother and her people. So I came back, to, I went to North Carolina where my mother's people are from and after maybe about 20 years of not seeing them I reconnected with the people there and I was I had experiences in the house where I lived where I was staying in South Carolina and I left and I went to Georgia from there and after Georgia I was I came back to Florida and in the different ways the different part during these times so I found a an old uh, uh, family reunion um, booklet from my great grandmother's uh, family from a family reunion that she had had when she was a maybe a little girl or in her early 20s and it was a, it showed some of our Gullah ancestry so it, so it had uh, words and names and it spoke about our Gullah and the celebration of the Gullah people coming back together in the booklet so that was a, a really powerful connection point for me because at the time I didn't really know anything about the Gullah and because my family had kind of replaced all of their African traditions with Christian ones, there was no one in the family at all still left alive who was able to really explain the Gullah connection to me. So through the process of Wajet, I actually was able to discover my own connection to the land. Right in the land that's just around this area, this this place, this is all um, one of the most sacred places for our people in the whole United States because this county here is the seat of the biggest slave rebellion in U.S. history. Uh, the slave rebellion was so big and so successful that the U.S. Army spent two and all two of its two and a half million dollar budget that was to cover the everything for the whole United States. It spent two million of that budget fighting Florida to try to quell the rebellion. Um, and so all of this land here um, is where our, our people lived here. They died here. They lived free on this land. And that was something really powerful to discover. So that happened for me one day. I was out in my backyard mowing the lawn and I was bitten by a black snake. Where I was, I was outside 
mowing the lawn and I got bitten by a snake out here. And the snake must have come from this shrubs, this area right over here. writing the book but I wasn't getting as much done as I wanted to um, and I was doing it but I, I had nothing really else to do there I worked from home and I was doing a lot of my spiritual work all the time getting very very connected with Wajet and so after this uh, after being bitten by this snake in the backyard I just was feeling really not understanding my purpose not understanding why there was so much struggle and I went to the shrine the next morning and I asked her like with this just really heartfelt cry of really just not understanding what was happening to me. I asked her, why am I going through all this? Why was I sent here? Why am I in Florida? What am I doing here? And in answer to the question, I had this vision while, right there while I was kneeling at the shrine of directly in the backyard in the exact spot where I had been bitten and just around the circle of that area, I saw men and or I saw men on horses and they were shooting at these women so there were women and children it was like a small village of women and children and I just heard them screaming I heard the women screaming I saw them getting shot I saw little children getting shot and there was just chaos everywhere uh, it seemed like these military people on horseback and so I could not understand so so in answer to my question about what was going on with me Wajet was giving me this image of people of women and children being slaughtered. I just literally witnessed a slaughter right in front of me and I couldn't understand why in response to what was going on with me did she give me that. And she told me the snake is a product of the land. The snake is a product of this land. This land is where all this took place. And the snake is still living the energy of what happened in this place. And she just left me with that. And so I kind of just really contemplated on what I was seeing and I, I took the experience with me away from the altar and it didn't occur to me until a few days later to actually look up what the history of Osceola County actually is. And I was really shocked to discover that specifically Osceola County was the seat of this huge slave rebellion, of this massive battle where uh, Andrew Jackson, who at the time was, I believe, the general of the United States, uh, and he chose to go out. His, his battle plan for quelling the slave rebellion was to come around all of this area here to capture the horses and to find all the, the, the hidden dens where the women and children were hidden whenever they would get away from slavery, when they would escape to their freedom. They were hidden out in different areas, like in these woods behind me. They were hidden all around different areas like these. And so their mission, they made it their mission to go and capture and slaughter all of the women and children and to capture all of the horses because they knew that the rebellion would be destroyed if the women and children were destroyed. And they would go, he would go in front of Congress and apologize for never having found us, for never having captured us, and then go back out and send a new general and send another general. And it took them two years to really capture us to the point where the battle started to turn. It took that long, two million dollars of their money from back then, and two years with all of the force that they had to capture us and to, to start to quell the rebellion. They had to sell off pieces of land um, in order to fund, in order to get enough money to fund it. So, so um, and all of this story is completely crushed into history. It's, it's, it's obliterated. It's not in any of the textbooks of history. It's not anywhere. But yet, when reaching back out to ancestral religion, reaching back out through my mother, through her same line, through my blood lineage, who she had reached out to me to let me know that she was there, that my ancestors were there. When I reached back out to her, all of this ancestry unfolded for me, all of this. So the practice that I have here, my, my personal practice is committed. I've been initiated by Wajet through the snake bite that she gave me. I've been initiated by Sir Ket. I was stung by a scorpion also. Um, and I've taken initiations directly and I've been reached out directly to by ancestors. And 
all of these things have, have made my practice. This isn't just a practice for me. This is part of my living reality because no one in my textbooks, no one in school, no one in college, no one ever told me about these things. I discovered all of the things that I know about my ancestry in this land here. I discovered why I was moving up and down the East Coast and searching for a deeper connection with myself and my roots. I discovered all that through my spiritual practice. So everything changed and became more real than everything else. And so the, the truth of the Wajet energy, of the power that I have through her, through everything that they bring me, is, is it's proven. It's proven by everything that I've been given, everything that I verify, everything that I understand now about the very land that I'm sitting on, about where I'm sitting, is, is a site of possibly where someone, some women and children were hidden in a camp and their voices are begging to be heard. Their voices are begging to come back to life through us. The ancestors don't, aren't just reborn through us, but they're reborn with a purpose, with a mission. And we have to fulfill that mission through them, but we have to understand who they are, what they went through, and then what we were reborn to do for them and with them. So one of the last parts of tying up my ancestral connection was discovering that my Gullah, my side of the Gullah family, led back to Namibia to some of the really beautiful tribal people that I know. Uh, Namibia is close to Angola, and Angola and Namibia, the, the people there are considered to be warriors. They're considered to be some among the greatest warriors. Uh, of all of the different African tribes and of all the, of the different people who were captured and came over here. And their spirit, the Gullah, Angola, Gullah, is the same lineage and the same warriorhood that comes through them. And so in discovering that my ancestral lineage led back there to that southern Western African coast, so there's Angola and Namibia and below there is Botswana. And Botswana is the oldest known cult of the snake in the world. It's 70,000 years old. There are caves there where there are snakes actually carved out of stone directly into the rock. And where over the last 70,000 years that our people have gone there and they leave, uh, they leave gifts, they leave sacrifices they leave parts of themselves so that their energy can continue to exist through the power of the snake so the connection to Wajet is in my most ancient lineage in my most ancient line and then through the Ovambo people of Namibia I discovered after being guided to take the to take the palm leaf while I was going through the initiation with Wajet uh, I was guided after the snake bite, sometime after the snake bite, to go to a different bush and to take a leaf from there and to give the leaf to my shrine and that the leaf would represent Sushat, who is part of my divine purpose for being here, the divine purpose of writing and journalism and the things that Sushat, Sushat language, the things that she's known for. And so I went to the place where I was guided to and I took a palm leaf from there. And so now I keep a palm leaf on my shrine. And when I got the palm leaf to my house, the first few days that I had it there, I had it propped up next to Sushat. And there was a really strong energy, like I felt a shift in my altar that way. And on maybe the third or fourth day that I had it, I was guided to take my cowrie shells, which I always use for divination anyway, and to actually cast them on top of the palm leaf and to feel what message I was told that Sushat would have a message in in very direct language by me connecting those two energies together so I took the I took the cowries and I cast them and as soon as I did that a very direct message about what I was supposed to do next 
and about how I was supposed to function and about how I was supposed to be with, with uh, Wajet all came to me exactly through the message. They gave me a very direct business plan, a, a format, and an understanding of what my purpose very exactly was going to be and would continue to be. And so I was um, really grateful for the for just this new energy, this new connection with this with this means of divination that I had never thought of, but I was guided to. And as I continued to further look into my my mother's ancestry through the Gullah, I looked into this, and it turns out that the Ovambo people in Namibia actually have this exact same species of palm leaf and they have a divination where they take the palm leaves and they take a certain kind of brown nut and they use four of them just like i have of the four shells they have these four brown nuts that are the seeds of some type of tree and they take the nuts and they shake it and they cast it on top of the palm leaf and this is an ancient system of divination that has been used by the obambo people for thousands of years and this is something that they brought with them in their traditions and without again just like i didn't know anything about the land the history through teachings or anything no books had taught me that that specific tradition that i that i took that came to me through my blood that came to me through my very own blood circle those messages were a direct speaking of my ancestors speaking to me and asking me to continue the, the traditions that i had and to keep them going forward. So just like my ancient ancestors, my the ancient priestesses who were in my line were able to cast these and get messages and give messages about what our purpose, what our soul purpose is here on earth, I also was able to take those messages and to also work with them. So again, this is another, another moment, another connection a really divine, powerful connection of how real ancestry is, how real your soul is, how real when you connect to your blood circle and to your line, your full purpose, your full understanding of your existence will come back to you. And this is just without question. This is, this is really real. It's not something that can come from books. This isn't something that can be taught. It's not something that some Egyptologist somewhere can Di dissect it's it's real these are the messages directly from our own divinities who speak to us and give us what we need my my mother's family when i grew up were all raised all 13 of my uh, grandmother's brothers and sisters um, were raised by my great-grandfather who was a pastor of his own church which is still standing in the town where my family from in North Carolina and it was absolutely forbidden in the house to discuss anything except white Jesus so among everything white Jesus had to be thanked for every victory um, everything that they did and but still somehow through all of the the Christian overtaking of their traditional culture they still managed to find certain terms and words and things like that that would come through. So there were little words that they didn't know. I remember as a child seeing like an auntie take something and um, throw it off the back porch, take some, take something and, and toss it down at the back porch just to keep the just to keep the bad energy away from the back there. But they would never discuss those things. They would never speak about those things in any kind of terms of what it really was and definitely not in African tradition because that was considered evil and that was something for the devil but all the traditions still survived so they would say oh yeah you know we did it we did this because mommy taught us we did this because mommy taught us and they would take things and they would toss it out and they would talk about this word they would say things about oh this this wanga just just and they would say these words and I and I would hear the word and I would never connect it I didn't understand what it meant at the time and much later, and again, coming back to my tradition, 
learning, coming to find out that wanga is part of our tradition again. Wanga is when you take the roots, you take the herbs, you take the roots, the sticks, you cast them out, you cast them, you change the energy of your environment based on the things that you have around you. So the things that our um, enslaved ancestors would use were things that came from this area, from this region. So they didn't look anything like the things that our ancestors from the continent would use, but the, but the tradition itself, the movement, the intention, and the actions were exactly the same. They would find the ways, and I can still remember movements of them going and taking things and tossing it out. And then to come all the way to here, to come to be part of this reality where my ancestors guided me to, and then to come to find out that wanga is actually an Ovambo word. So without even knowing, without even realizing that they were still penetrating the Christian tradition that had been imposed on them, my family was still using words, still using movements, actions, and words that were directly descended and given to them by the Ovambo people. Because the word wanga, is a, is a, that's an Ovambo word. That's a word of us. And so these, these same things are buried. They're, they're inside of our DNA. They can't go anywhere. They can't be, they can be overlaid with all sorts of other traditions, but there's no way for what is really alive inside of us, for what is really divine inside of us to disappear. There's no way. My name is Mama Malusi Ashikir. I come to you from the bloodline of the Deep South, Honeyada, Mississippi. I come to you by way of spirit in the form of Juju. Juju means to cast, and yet are we not casted through our bloodlines into this present moment. I bring the herbs of my bloodline from my grandmother to her great grandmother and her great great grandmother and her great great grandmother. Do I bring the womb work of my bloodline as I am a midwife and a root worker? In my presentation on root work, my intention is to help you to understand how we heal. A lot of times we look at the spirituality and we're seeking, uh, uh, we're looking outward at spirituality as it is outside of us. But the goal of spirituality is to hold together all that is you and all that is within the order of the all, of, of God, of that one self, to hold us all together, hold it all together, and then to help it to move and flow harmoniously. Juju helped us in the deep south in order to make sense of things. As people, as people passed and people came, we helped out, we helped each other to ease pain and to celebrate and joy. We use herbs in every sense. Throughout the celebration of birth, did we use herbs for healing? Do we use herbs to uh, make sure that there was no infection? But we also used herbs to help that person to pass on to the next round. We also helped use herbs to help that person to deal with certain situations in the here and now. These herbs were used extensively uh, to bring about those, to bring about the divinities in order to bring about the divine in us.
some of the herbs that we use then and we use now are rosemary. Rosemary works really well for obatala in the clearing even of our ori and in the awakening of our sight beyond sight. We also use sage as sage worked as well for obatala in order to help us to bring about wisdom. These herbs, along with mint and lavender, helped us to open and awaken our ori in order so that we might know the divine within us. There was a lot of change that happened through just the use of the body vessel. The herbs that we use today for our divinities, for our divine self, and how we manifest are Shango uses the peppers, uh, the jalapeno pepper, the, the hot top pepper, many different red peppers. And Legba uses all herbs. Not just does he use plant herbs, but he also uses all fruit and all vegetation. All Ewe. Ogun uses herbs for the heart. So herbs like hawthorn berry and Herbs like blood roots are used for Ogun. Herbs that are very important to Yemaya are herbs that support the breast or the chest area. And that's blessed thistle, basil, also red raspberry. She works and she takes care of the womb. But it is Yema Yah's uh, place to keep the breast flowing with milk. Bless thistle, fenugreek, mother's wart, keep the mother calm. For Oshun, she protects the womb. So with her, we use a we have a tradition of using chamomile tea, yellow flowers, along with red raspberry to calm the womb during menstruation. And then we wrap the we uh, wrap the womb with a red with excuse me with the yellow ribbon as well as yellow waist beads for that woman during pregnancy. She is the keeper of the womb. The ovaries are Yemaya. The vagina, the birth canal is Oya. Oya's herbs are those base seed herbs. Those herbs that uh, help to stimulate and strengthen. Ginger, also uh, she utilizes ginsengs, American ginseng, and moringa in order to strengthen the body. Red clover is also her herb as well as clove and myrrh are for Oya. These herbs all work together, however, in order to strengthen different parts of our bodies, just like each Orisha are associated with different parts of our bodies. And they work for us in many different ways. They heal us, but they also, herbs can also be used to take a life. In the form of poisons, we see poke root was used. Also, arsenic came from a very natural source. Mushrooms were also used in the form of poisons. 
processed in just the way so that they can be effective in foods or in drinks or water, things like that. Our health is so sacred that there were times in which we had to secure ourselves during violation to keep us from having children. And women used cotton seed in order to close their womb to the seed of their rapist. Also, we also used different herbs in order to uh, ensure that our babies lived in times in which we may be pregnant by our own love mate. So at times in which uh, stress was put on in circumstances for which we lived, we were able to use different herbs to clear out toxins like cerise. These herbs were used specifically in order to remove certain toxins from our bodies and to strengthen our blood. Also, we used um, different herbs in order to eliminate arthritis, devil's claw, cat's claw. We used different herbs in order to heal ourselves from sickness like malaria and yellow fever. Uh, plants are very intimate with us. They work and move and literally have the same genetic encoding as our red blood cells. I am in Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati, Ohio rests at the belly of the Serpentine River, Ohio. Ohio River. That river is south of the Serpent Mound. In between is the open mouth of the fault line of Mama Earth. As I say, y'all. Information. I am being educated and informed through As I say, y'all. To my person in relation to the herbs for which I use and how to use them to heal the person. How to use them in order to support life. Healers were very important to our communities as in, in, in captive, captivity or what they would call slave communities they would not allow physicians to attend to us, so we had to attend to each other. Thus, we literally created in and of ourselves a culture for birth and a culture for death. The culture for birth was one in which a midwife would come to the house of the, of the mother in labor. And she would bring with her her herbs that she would use to help to calm and soothe the mother. She would also bring with her the things that she needed in order to bless the child once that child came into the world. She knew that as that child spiraled into the world, that that child was coming and awakening its ancestral DNA. And that ancestral DNA was necessary for that child to be able to navigate in the world that it was coming into. That, one, that midwife would give thanks and praise to Oya for bringing that child safely into the world and allowing that child to take its first breath. The midwife was not only the conductor on that sacred, in that sacred space, but she, because she was able to bring forward the baby and mother through that sacred space. She also was that priest that helped to bless them as they had and celebrate them as they made it to this side of that journey. 
she also ushered them through gestation from conception on to labor by helping her, helping that mother to take the herbs to help her baby to stick and stay so she didn't lose that child and kept and brought that baby forward. Also, she helped mothers who did not want to keep the child that may be coming due to ill-gotten gains. As a midwife, today, as I carry the bloodline of midwives from Honey Island, Mississippi to today, I am blessed to be able to impart to mothers the importance of their health, the importance of their consum consumption of whole and vibrant foods, healthy living foods, and help them to navigate the madness of food, uh, herb, and chemical genocide that has been enacted against us. To help to protect those mothers and help them to uh, usher their, help, them, help to usher them on this path has been my journey. Even in the hustle and bustle of the city, we have life. We have a responsibility to preserve life. We have a responsibility We have a responsibility to take life seriously and not just like a microwave treat really take a look as healers once you identify yourself as a healer then you are not only seeking to heal other people but foremost your responsibility is healing yourself foremost my responsibility to heal myself it is only through the testimony of me healing myself that anyone will believe that I'm a healer As a healer, we have sacred herbs. And one that is sacred to me is the everlasting life. The everlasting life is a plant that has followed us uh, from our homeland in Africa to our present living here and in the islands. Everlasting life is a plant that um, has many names, um, Mother of Millions, several other names, even names in Spanish uh, for, during the, in the Lukumi tradition. And um, we use the everlasting life plant in many different ways. It can be used in the tea in order to provide sustainable energy and, and strengthen your life force. Uh, it can be ground and used in food. It can also be used in spiritual work when cleaning your ori. Your ori is a very sacred divinity for what you were born with. There is an apotheke about the ori, which speaks of the fact that the ori is greater than them all. There even 
the divinities have an ori, and we also have an ori. Thus, they are orisha, and we are as well. And with such being the case, when we clean our heads in order to clear our ori of the debris of living, we then strengthen our ori with everlasting life by putting it on our heads and then covering our heads with our cloth. In the strengthening of our ori, it helps us as we navigate through life, we're able to see beyond sight. We're able to be clear on what we do see. And we're able to speak with our divine self rather than our mortal self. Our ori is so sacred that when a child is coming into the world and spiraling, down the birth canal. That child's cranium is compacted. And as it is born, it then comes open. And that the skull then takes a normal stance. But as it normalizes itself, your ori is awakening. And it is, it is um, scanning and assessing the world that it is born into. That is such a sacred time for babies. You know, we often speak of the tradition of the grandmother molding the head. But it is also grandma's blessing of that crown that helps that child to hold his head straight. My pot. I carry um, a pot in the tradition, in my tradition of spirituality, because it is likened unto a womb. It is not only the womb, you have a womb of your body. Males have a prostate, females have a womb. Uh, but we also have a womb of our minds. Our mind is one in which there are things that we hold as truths to be self evident and things that we feel are real. But then we also have a womb of spirit. And so as above, so below, we have a womb of spirit for which uh, our spirit sends us things, tells us things, connects us with people and places, dimensions in certain time. I keep this womb because what it does is I keep my, what I, it is a keeper of my tools. There are certain tools that I use in order to navigate through the dimensions of space, matter, and time. And I keep them in my pot that is sacred so that they can be kept in a matter for which I have consecrated them for and not to be misused or, not, or energy not to be. So it's in essence, it's a protection for that, just like the womb is a protection for your children or your, your womb is a protection for your babies. And the womb of your mind is a protection for your thoughts. This is a womb, this is a protection for the things that, that I use for spirit. Royalty and loyalty inside our DNA We got sauce, we be dunking them all inside your NBA We the juice, got that funk and the blues inside our DNA B-L-A-C-K, pal, we all deep inside our DNA Blind with jealousy, they hate but no, we can't be replicated No, they so aggravated, need a verb on us Annihilate us, dead and fed us, face that wasted Busted, don't be facing greatness Heavy is a head that wears a crown I got crystals and magicians written on my DNA Double S is my double access, it's almost Shango Flame Spiritual Vision 2020, I say that I see, okay? Be no secret, I got E, I, me all in my DNA
my metric plan and Patrick plan forebearers relocated to Chicago from Mississippi and Alabama during the great migration up north. This was another expression of escaping from enslavement to establish a new life. I learned recently for the first time that my family had ancestry in Virginia during the late 1700s and so I was directed by my ancestresses and ancestors to Richmond, Virginia and the so-called Slave Trail. This is the land they were forced to march, chained together. Upon my arrival, they brought down the rain and torrents to never let us forget their, our, unburnable nature. That means greetings to all Apurakani, Apurakani people, meaning Africans, black people. My name is Ojirafo Kwesi Ranehempata Akam. Ojirafo of the Apamu Nation in North America within Ojiramai, the purified nation, Apurakani, Apurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. So hudu comes from the Akan term undu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life. Undu also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession and spirit communication. So we also find that that term with those same two meanings exists in the language of ancient Kanat, which is a title of ancient Nubia, meaning uh, medicine from roots, trees, plant life, it also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession, spirit communication. After invasions from the whites and their offspring in the Hapi Valley, so-called Nile Valley, over 2,000 years ago, some of our people migrated from ancient Kanat, ancient Nubia, and Kemet, and re-established themselves and re-established the Kanat Empire in the western part of the continent of Afuraka, Afuraka. So you have the empire of Ghana or Kanat re-established. Hundreds of years later, some of our people migrated from that region and migrated further south to the forest belt and savannah regions in the regions of contemporary Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, and Republic of Ghana and reestablished Akana civilization in those regions. Centuries after that, some of our people were forced from those regions and taken to North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kessier, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. This is how our people migrated from ancient Kanat, Nubia, across to West Afuraka, Afuraka, the Empire of Ghana, into the Savannah Forest Belt regions and the Akan civilization, and then into North America. This is why Hudu is the Akan ancestry religion in North America, and you find the various terms and ritual practices that are all Akan terms and ritual practices based on Akan cosmology as part and parcel of the Hudu tradition. The term Hudu, the term Mojo, which comes from the Akan term Moja, the term Jack or Jack Ball coming from the Akan term Jap and Japadie, the term Haint coming from the Akan term Hinti, the term Kanje or Kanje coming from the Akan term Kanche, meaning to utter incantations to bring down the spirits and so forth. These various terms are all Hudu terms, but they are Akan terms from Akan language and culture, and they can only be properly defined in the cosmology, language, and ritual practice of our Khan people. So when we were forced from Afuraka, Afuraika, hundreds of years ago, from the Akan empires hundreds of years ago, forced into North America, the manner in which we practiced ancestral religion at that moment, at that point, was fossilized in our bones and blood. And it is that pristine culture that we transmitted intergenerationally and transcarnationally to our descendants for 300 plus years. So that is Hudu in North America. That is our Khan ancestral religion in North America. So we have a specific form of Adebisa, divination. There are a number of different forms that we utilize, but 
the major form of Adebisa divination within the Akwamu Nation in North America, Akwamu Mai and Amaruka Itzifimu, within the Hudu tradition, is this form of divination wherein we utilize cockle shells, so-called seashells, in the context of water gazing. So we'll give you the story about how we were able to procure the implements of this system and it is instructive with regard to the transcarnational transmission of culture, the intergenerational transmission of culture and ritual practice through successive reincarnations in our matric clans and patric clans. So we had an elderess who came to us. She had received divination from a diviner in a different system. She's living in another state. She asked us to elucidate um, some of the information that was given. This is a number of years ago. 21 years ago, as a matter of fact. So we told her we would get back to her after we went through that process. I was directed by the Abosom Nana Ajua, who is called Aset in ancient Kemet. She's also called Achuat in ancient Kemet as well. Ajua and Akan. She directed me to immerse myself in her element, which is the water. So I immersed myself in water, in the bathroom, in the tub, and so forth. Immerse myself in water to commune with the divinity. I was simply seeking to get further elucidation on the information that the elders was asking about. But at that particular moment, Nana Adwa gave to me this system of divination ut utilizing the cockle shells in the water. So when I came out of that ritual process, my mindset was, I'm going to have to find out where I can procure these shells for this system that Nana Adwa gave to me. Now, a few days later, a very close friend of mine who had been visiting relatives in Florida, she returned from Florida, came back home to Chicago. She was excited to tell me about her trip, but she said before she could tell me about her trip with her relatives, she had to do something very important. So she left the room, came back in. She had a number of jars where she had gathered some seawater and brought them back in the jars, and that's something that she does when she goes out of town. But what she did was she took one of the jars, she drank the seawater, and then she sprayed my face with the seawater and simultaneously handed me a handful of cockle shells or seashells. And then she said when she was in the Gulf, Yemonja told her to look down by her feet, grab those seashells, and give them to Ra. He will know what they're for. Now, after she told me that, she said, I know this probably sounds crazy. I don't know why I'm doing it. And that's when I told her about the entire ritual process of myself being submerged in the water, receiving the system, and then um, she coming in and give me, giving me those, those shells. Now, there are two things that are important in this regard. First and foremost, typically, when we receive the implements for our practice, they come from parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so forth, those who are diviners as well. When you apprentice with them, those within your family and so forth, because you have received this capacity to divine through your blood circle, through your um, incra and incrabia, your divine function and creation. And that comes with you when you were born into the world, when you incarnate through your specific matric clan or patric clan and so forth. Typically those within the same matric clan or patric clan who are engaged in the divinatory process, when they see that you are one of those who are to divine, you apprentice with them. And then when it's time for you to begin that process on your own, they procure those shells for you or the implements for you, or they direct you and assist you in the process of making that procurement yourself. Because of what has happened with our people, brainwashed with Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, with the fictional cartoon characters who never existed, Jesus, Yeshua, Ben Pandera, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Solomon, Shiva, Menelik, Moses, Aaron, Buddha, Brahman, Mahavira, Allah, Yahweh, all of these fictional cartoon characters who never existed of any race or of any form whatsoever, as we've proven in our book, Kuku Tum Tum, The Ancestral Jurisdiction. Because of that infection, Many of our people are not practicing the tradition on the surface. So the manner in which we procure our implements for divination instead of going directly to the great grandparent, grandparents, parents, and so forth, we receive that information and those implements 
in a different fashion, but we end up in the same space. This is what's taking place across the country. It's been happening for hundreds of years. This is what took place here. Another key um, ingredient, the second key ingredient, Yemoja is the name of the mother of the waters in the Yoruba tradition. My friend was familiar with the Yoruba tradition, so she utilized that terminology, but she's involved in the Akan tradition. The name of the ocean mother in the Akan tradition is Epo Abena. Epo means ocean. Abena is her kradin or soul name associated with someone who came into being on Benada or Abenada, which is Tuesday. All females born on Tuesday or Abenada, Abenada receive the name Abena. Males receive the kradin or soul name Kwabena. My friend is an Abena. So Nana Epo Abena, the divinity of the ocean, directed one of her daughters, Abena, to come to the ocean. While I was immersed in water in Chicago, she was in the ocean in Florida to procure those shells because those shells are governed by Nana Ajua and this is the divination system that she wanted me to utilize. So I received the, that divination, those implements, and began that process. We cast the shells into the water and the abosom begin to show us what's taking place within the life of the individual who's coming for this inquiry. What abosom are governing specific situations and what nananom unsamanfo ancestresses and ancestors who are spiritually cultivated are governing certain situations and what forces in creation and ancestral spirits need to be aligned with in order to bring balance to the situation. To give you a quick example of how that process unfolds. There was a sister who requested divination from us, someone who was part of a social media network that we had established, a number of people who study ancestral religion. This is a sister we had never come in contact with and never met, but she learned about our social media network at the time, joined that network, and would receive updates about books and things like that that were publishing or um, events. When she learned about Adebisa divination, she simply sent an email asking, will we perform divination for her? We said yes, and then we would get back to her later and give that information, set up a time to go over the divination to see what came out. Now, we don't ask people what they are coming to get divination for. If you're a real diviner, you tell them what they're coming to receive that divination for. You should be able to tune into that and learn exactly what needs to be reached, what needs to be understood, what needs to be said, what needs to be embraced and so forth. So this is an individual who's living in a different country, someone we never saw, someone we never met, and this was a number of years ago and still have never seen the individual, never met the individual. Of course, we only divine for Afurakani, Afurakani, African black people, so that's the only thing we knew about the individual. So. When we cast the shells in the water, the Abosom began to show us what's taking place in the person's life. Just to give you a snippet of what took place in a very extensive reading that lasted probably 45 minutes, we'll give just a, about a two or three minute section of that reading. The Abosom showed me, Nana Ajwa showed me, the young woman walking into an apartment complex. She came into an apartment and then she walked over to a portion of the apartment where it was similar like a corner and it was shaded and so forth. There was a, another individual who was in the apartment on the balcony. There was a brother in the, in the apartment on the balcony. He did not see her enter into the apartment. He didn't see that she was standing in the corner where it was shaded. So he was on the balcony and he was out there by himself just hanging out and so forth. He, he was leaning on the balcony. He had on a baseball cap turned backwards. He was just out there. Moments later, a brother came into the apartment. He walked out 
to the balcony. He saw the other brother. They greeted one another. They started talking and so forth. That brother did not see the young woman inside the apartment either because she was again in the corner so she wasn't detected. So as the two brothers were talking, at some point the brother who had walked in out, out to the balcony to meet the other brother walked up to him and began to kiss the brother on the mouth. So of course this is insane. It's a manifestation of dissexuality and we use dissexuality instead of homosexuality because dis is more proper as a term, dis meaning not, such as disorder meaning, meaning order is not present. Dissexuality means sexuality is not present, it's not occurring. Sexuality only occurs between the Afurakani man, Afurakani woman, African black man, African black woman. Anything else is perverse, insane, and it's repelled, repulsed, and hated by the divinities, the forces in nature, the supreme being, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, hated and rejected by reality. So this sexual deviance was manifest. This is what they are showing. At that point, the sister came from out of the shadow. At the same time, the Abosom Abena, who is called Sekhmet in ancient Kemet, which is called Sechima or Sechimet in Akan, as well as Abena in Akan. She's also called Beda in ancient Kemet. That divinity came out of the sky in the form of a sacred bird animal totem, swooped down and blew the entire back of the head off the body of the brother, showing that that perverse, sexually deviant practice is out of harmony with order. Sekhmet, Sechima, is the enforceress of divine order. She also governs the lymphatic system within the great divine body and within the physical body of the Afurakani male, Afurakani female. So as she swooped down as that animal told him and blew the entire back of the head off the body of the, the male, the young woman came along with her and then Sekhmet left the building, Abana left the building and the sister in approval left the building as well. Now this is just a couple of minutes of a snippet of a 45 minute plus reading where there were a number of different things going on. But as I was recounting what took place in the divination to the sister later on, when I got to that portion and described what took place, she stopped me and said, oh, I know who that is. Last year I found out that my father is a homosexual and I have not talked to him since. Now, of course, number one, that's a good process that she recognized the sexual deviance and she cut the pervert off. But the key is, number one, we've never met. She lives in a different country. She didn't tell me anything about what was going on in her life, but that's a major event that's going on in her life. It's gonna to totally shift the manner in which she communicates with family members, how she deals with her children in regard to other family members who are accepting of that kind of deviance, protecting her children from that, protecting herself from that, totally restructuring her entire life. Her finding out something perverse about her father, which apparently had been going on for years and so forth that she didn't know about growing up, that totally shifted her entire perception. It was a major impactful event in her life and affected her in a number of different ways. Of course, the Abosom zoomed in on that. So when we, they showed me that scene after casting the shells in the water and gazing in the water and so forth, that was confirmed by the system. They also showed a number of different things going on with physical health, going on with the child, going on with a number of different things that were happening in the life of the sister, but also what ritual processes she could engage in, that she needed to engage in to rectify and bring balance to imbalance situations. This is the means by which we learn how to incorporate divine law and restore divine balance in our lives. Ancestral religion is the ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine balance. We find out what is in harmony with order, look at the various situations in our lives, we assess every thought, every intention, every action, every moment of every day, and seek to align our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order every moment of every day. When we make mistakes, legitimate mistakes, 
and we need to correct ourselves to bring balance to our lives. We engage the ritual process to ritually incorporate divine law and ritually restore divine balance. Divination, adibisa, is part of that process. That includes not only what's happening in our physical bodies or our spirit bodies and so forth, or in our communities, but also within our Oman, the Afurakani, Afurakani, Oman, or nation. This is why Adebisa, or divination, was instrumental in the waging of war against the whites and their offspring. Every major war against the whites and their offspring, so-called insurrections, uh, movements of resistance, rebellions, wars against the whites and their offspring, whether it's Okunfo Yao, Nat Turner, Okunfo Kwabena, Warrior Kwabena, Denmark Visi, Nana Abena Araminta, which is Harriet Tubman, people waging war against the whites in their offspring and forcing the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere because we were incessantly waging war guided by the Nananom Nsamampo and the Avosom, the spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors and the deities through the process of Adebisa learning where the enemy was, when they were going to strike, how they were going to send dogs out, what kind of poisons that they would use, and then we would utilize our own methods. We took up metal armaments, fashioned metal armaments to wage war against the White Snarl Spring. We also used hoodoo root work and so forth for chemical and biological warfare. Root work conjure established the precedent for chemical and biological warfare to be waged against our enemies, the whites and their offspring in the Western Hemisphere. We utilize root work to wage war in the past, and we have the shoulders of our ancestresses and ancestors to stand upon and that foundation to build upon, to utilize root work conjure in the capacity of waging chemical and biological warfare against our enemies the whites and their offspring in this present day. During enslavement, sisters carrying certain roots, certain herbs in their hair and so forth coming in from the field, poisoning the soup, poisoning the various food items and so forth and drinks to wage war against the whites and their offspring chemically and biologically. And when they became ill, when they fell ill, we would rout them, kill them, burn down the plantations and free our people. In the same fashion, we have that capacity to utilize chemical and biological warfare today. We work in the hospitality industry. Millions of our people work in the restaurant industry, work in hospitals, work in labs. We work everywhere. We're all over the country in every field of endeavor. We have the capacity within our own ancestral religious practices to inflict major damage on our enemies. Our enemies are waging war against us in the streets, shooting our people down in the streets, fake cops killing our people, murdering our people in the streets. We have the capacity to take out millions of our enemies once we re-embrace our ancestral religious practice. So we need to understand that medicine is offensive and defensive. Ancestral religion is offensive and defensive. We have the capacity, we have the motive, we have the drive, and now we have the consciousness, San Kofa, to return, go and grasp our culture and utilize it in the total liberation of our people. Fighter, fighter, it's who I am. Am I plan my work, work, then work my plan. plan. 
I'm a soldier, soldier. But I'll be damned Damn. If I'm a murder, murder For Uncle Sam, Sam. Sam. Straight up rebel, rebel I hate the devil, devil And what he trying to do I kick that verbal voodoo yeah. I see right through you, hoo I say you hoo-roo, hoo With Jaws, bless, bless I and I never stress I got them words, words And I won't retire I got that splurge, splurge Catch a fire, fire I'm on the move, move To open mics and ciphers I got an ego, ego The people's righteous writer Ride or die, die For my fam Red, black, and green Green In my hand Up on the new new. What all the scams So you know know Where I stand stand. Guess who, who The group who sat by the door We brought you positive pollution But you still wanted more You who, who, who That's what we doing it for Fighting the confusion And building the revolution Guess who, who The group who sat by the door We brought you positive pollution But you still wanted more You who, who That's what we doing it for Fighting the confusion and building for revolution.